Hello. Hello, my dear DLD community. Hello, friends. Good to see you back. Welcome to our first DLD sync after the summer break. I'm very much hoping that you're healthy and you, that you're fit and fine and that you're still curious and not bored about quarantines and many things which are going on around us. I'm very happy to host this show for, with Rachel Botsman. Some of you have seen her at DLD 2019, just before the show with Shell Sandberg. She gave a talk on trust before Shara, Shell Sandberg. And it was amazing. It was an amazing kickoff of a very necessary and important discussion. Ask yourself, what is trust for you? How are you, are you dealing with the trust for your own, your self-confidence? Do you trust your friends? Yes, of course you should. Do you trust the media? Not so sure anymore. Do you trust the society, the parties around you? What is your relation to trust? This is an amazing topic. And Rachel Botsman, who is in, in, in her professional life, a lecturer at the Oxford University at the Side Business School. And she, she's an author of two important books. One is on, on the sharing economy and the other is of course on trust. And she will be part in discussion, part of this uh, essential part of um, our next thoughts about DLD, about our topic, what are you adding to society, to yourself? And she will be interviewed by our good friend, our journalist in residence, Carson Lamb. Carson Lamb. Carson is, since many years, um, our, our intellectual face of DLD. <laughs> Carson, thank you for doing this. Rachel, thank you so much for being with us again. You're, you're a wonderful person, and we are very proud that you're here. Well, Have a good thank show. you very much, Steffi. <laughs> thank you, Steffi, for this for this uh, very nice, very kind introduction. Um, and thank you very much, Rachel, Rachel for, for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. I also remember your talk at DLD19. We have it on our DLD News website for everybody who wants to revisit it later. Um, and thank you to all of you out there interested in this. Um, Rachel, let's let's dive right into this enormously important topic, uh, trust. I think we all know what it means on a personal level, that we cannot live without trusting friends, family, our loved ones. But how important is trust for society? What, what do we need it for? This is still on a, a small question there. <laughs> it's a huge oh, yeah. question. Um, <laughs> I'm going to break it down um, into sort of uh, two big picture camps um, in terms of why trust is so important in society right now. Um, there's what you could look at as sort of the external lens, so the external role of trust um, in systems, in technology, <clears throat> in government, in institutions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how we place our confidence in things that aren't inside our control that have a huge impact on our lives. So that's sort of the external role of trust. Um, if you don't have trust, these institutions break down, society breaks down. Um, and then there's another side to trust, uh, which is trust in ourselves. Um, yes, trust in ourselves in the sense that we can tolerate uncertainty, that we can navigate these unknowns um, but trust is like a gatekeeper um, trust in our minds controls the information and the people that we should let in so trust shapes what we believe and who we believe so if we think of all the conversations around truth and information, um, trust is playing a key role in that because it's the gatekeeper to information in our own personal lives, what we place faith or confidence in. 
And one of the greatest skills that we can have right now in our lives is being incredibly discerning and careful about where we place that trust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what's interesting is for 10 years, I've been really interested in sort of the external view of things. So the trust in technology, trust in marketplaces, trust in institutions. And I think now the more pressing question is to try to help people understand how this very complex process works in our own minds, because this makes us more informed. This puts us far more in control in a world that feels so outside of our control. Mm -hmm. Why? So that's a very good point. You mentioned a lot of things that I want to touch upon uh, later. And also uh, for everybody listening out there, we already got a number of questions. We will work those into our conversation. And, and of course, you see a little chat box in front of you where you can submit your questions. So please do that um, because we want this to be interactive. Um, why, why do you think, Rachel, that... Um, we are seeing such a loss of trust in things that for many years, if not decades, we've always taken for granted, you know, the, the trust in science, for example, um, or the trust that, that um, governments, at least in Western liberal democracies, will not betray us, um, that, they, that, that um, uh, our, our votes, for example, will not get lost uh, in between the post office and where they are counted. Things like this are suddenly a matter of, of worldwide debate. Uh, why is that? I think it comes down to, there's many drivers, but if I had to pick two, um, the first has to do with scale. Um, many of these systems just got too big. And the bigger a system becomes, uh, the more trust that's required, the more unknowns there are. That's the very essence of trust. So the way I define trust is trust is a confident relationship with the unknown. So if you make the system bigger, the postal service, the financial system, uh, whatever it may be, uh, you require more and more trust. Um, and this is, is really interesting to me because if you think of sort of um, emerging threads and trends, so the rise of local food, the belief in local communities, um, rethinking sort of smaller systems of government, that's all about you know, taking these huge systems where people cannot understand how they operate and have lost complete faith that they serve the individual versus serving the system and trying to make them more familiar and manageable to people. So this is a really important question in terms of trust, how big is big enough? That when systems uh, exceed a certain size, they become very hard to trust by their pure scale. The second is tied to our relationship to authority and expertise and influence. Um, so if you think about it for a long time, the way if I think of my own grandparents and I think of who they trusted and their relationship to society and, and, and their professional lives, it was very top down and hierarchical, right? It was, it was very linear. Uh, you looked up to people, they were the people that you that you trusted. And by the pure inherent nature of technology, we've in inverted that model on its head. And we see through the research that people trust their friends and their peers and people that are close to them more than they trust experts and authorities. And the implications of that, Kirsten, are enormous, right? Like, I mean, it applies to science, it applies to economics, it applies to expertise across the board. Um, and, you know, so many of the root causes of misinformation and conspiracy theories lies in the fact that we don't know who to trust because these relationships and these patterns have got far more complicated in our lives. So it's no longer linear, it's no longer hierarchical. We don't look up to authority in the same way it's become more and more fragmented and distributed, which which makes it complicated. So um, complicated, sure. But on the other hand, don't, don't we have so many more ways of checking, for example? You used to have to trust, let's say, your doctor. And if the doctor said it's this or that, you had to take it at face value these days or go to another doctor, perhaps. These days, many, many patients, of course, 
already come to the doctor and per perhaps drive her or him crazy by saying, I Googled it, I know what it is. So we can basically fact check everything. We can go on the, on the internet and um, have many, many more ways to be informed. Uh, shouldn't that, that kind of transparency in effect, shouldn't, shouldn't that actually make it easier and, or, and, and, and um, uh, not give conspiracy theories and other things uh, a chance to even be taken seriously? Yes and no, because the more information you have, uh, the more informed you have, it doesn't mean that that information is less, is necessarily trustworthy. So it can actually, I mean, it's an obvious thing to say, but I think this is um, sort of a misperception about trust. It's not about the volume of information, it's really about the quality of information. And what we lack is still the signals to tell us whether information is trustworthy and whether it's not. I mean, it's it's really astonishing given the sophistication of, of platforms and the distribution of information that we are still relying on mechanisms from 20 years ago. So, mm -hmm. you know, the most obvious example, you know, people point to uh, how Amazon and eBay and, and systems based on rating reviews, but really we're still we're still relying on stars and feedback that people have left so it's not that i don't believe i deeply believe in this new system of distributed trust and, and the way it can democratize information it's that the mechanics are still incredibly clunky um so the way we verify things um even the and i spoke about this at dld you know i believe many of the solutions lie in slowing people down. Mm -hmm. You know, like teaching people what skepticism is and how to dole their trust out well. And the speed that information travels, the way that these systems work, the way that we gather and absorb information is designed to do the very opposite of that. So what I, I worry about and where I think we need to be investing a lot of time and energy is actually not, we can't stop the flow of information, but it's the mechanisms that empower us to really decide whether this uh, information is trustworthy or not. Do, do you have suggestions for how to do, uh, to improve this, how to not rely on, on Uh, all these old mechanisms, but rather have something appropriate to this age of information overflow? Well, I think one of the mistakes we make is, and we often do this, we try and take, we're trying to take mechanisms. I mean, you see this in the debate around media versus social media, right? So we try and take a regulation or a way of thinking that apply, apply to the old world mm -hmm. and apply it to this, this new world of trust and information and that's that's not going to get us anywhere um do i have solutions in terms of uh verification of information i don't is the honest answer i i really um struggle right now with particularly social media um with the solutions that are on the table you know i i hear the same ones over and over again you know make the platforms responsible for the content um build in tighter systems for verification of that information or turn the system off well none of those seem like viable solutions to me so um it's not where i'm spending my energy and time my energy and time is more on helping people understand how they absorb the information because i think you know in the same way that um we sort of understand how our body works like an immune system we have a rough understanding of how we defend diseases and illnesses and what our bodies let in. Um, I think very few people have an understanding of, of how their minds work and what draws them to some information and some people and what pushes them away. So I'm not sure it's the answer you're looking for, but I really believe the solutions lie within, within self-awareness and education um, in the same way that you can educate people around tobacco and diet and all these things, I think we can do the same thing if we really help people understand how their minds consume information, how we decide what to let in and how we decide what we believe to be true or not. Can you share any insights into 
you know, how we should, what we can do to, to not have our minds be poisoned in effect uh, by misinformation, but rather, um, uh, you know, come, come to, you, you just said dealing with information in a healthier way. What, what does that look like? Well, I think that there's two, there's two um, key pieces of advice that I'd have for the audiences. The, the first is, um, particularly when you're faced with a piece of information that you're trying to explain something incredibly complex, or you're trying to explain something where you're really searching for an answer, um, ask yourself not what you believe, but why are you believing that? M move away from the what the belief is and what the information, really ask yourself, uh, why am I being drawn into this piece of information? Why do I want to believe this to be true? I mean, COVID-19 is, COVID is a classic example, right? Like, why do I want to believe that explanation? Why do I want to believe that vaccines are the miracle cure? And even developing an awareness around this and starting to understand our motivations can help you start to realize what you're being pushed or pulled away from is really, really key. Um, the second is developing an awareness of how much trust is driven by your tribe, how much trust is driven by who you are and who you want to be, your identity. And so, so many ways we make decisions, so many of the ways that we absorb knowledge is not based on the factual or um, the credible weight of that information. It's based on the social benefit of what it does to our identity and tribe. And even becoming aware of those two things, what's motivating my belief? Why do I believe that? Why am I being pushed or pulled away from this person or this piece of information? And is this belief serving something really practical and functional in my life, or is it about social identity? It, that slows you down, right? Mm -hmm. Even having to go through that process. Now, I'm not suggesting we do this with all different decisions in our lives, but with important decisions about whom to vote for, or um, climate change, or um, health decisions, th this is something that we should be training ourselves to do. Mm -hmm. Do you see the willingness for that kind of self-reflection? I do. Um, and this goes back to where we're, I think people are tired and they, well, I think it's on a spectrum from fatigue, frustration to anger, um, to complete dismay um, and complete distrust, to be honest, that they're going to find any solutions in the external world. Right. I think there's sort of a loss of hope that um, these are going to come from external sources so that the social media companies will find the solutions around this and government will sort itself out. And so what I'm seeing is and I, I really believe in this, that the individual is rising up saying, hang on a minute, if I can make smarter decisions about um, how to trust and I can develop that as a skill. Um, there's an empowering element to that that gives you again some sense of control so i'm hearing that from people is that the questions are shifting the questions are less about how does this person or this institution solve this problem and now it's much more about what i can do and whether that's come out of you know lockdown and an intense period of introspection um i'm not sure but the focus i think is turning much more on the individual and the individual wanting to understand how they think versus just a fatigue around blaming external factors and, and outside forces that are outside of their control. So um, I, I uh, am struggling a little bit with that observation simply because it seems to me that we're still caught in this, in this um, completely polarized world where you just talk, spoke about tribalism. Mm. You know, there's this one side that said that believes Bill Gates is somehow responsible uh, for COVID -19, the COVID-19 pandemic. And there are the other ones who say, how can you even believe this? And both sides aren't, do not seem to be even communicating on the same wavelengths. Um, how, how can we come to some kind of meaningful 
exchange of ideas. And this, well, of course, is just one example. Sorry. No, no. So I think it's it's a really fair and valid observation that you know how can you have this self reflection, but yet you see this divisiveness and amplification of division around beliefs like we've never seen before. Um, you know, stage one in order to understand other people's beliefs, in order to understand where other people are coming from, you have to understand yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the problem um, is that, you know, in so much debate, um, we pit two sides against one another. Um, in so many of the ways campaigns are structured, it's, uh, you know, pro and against, um, left and right. Like th this is the way society is having the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I know it sounds optimistic, but in order for people to even start to ask the question about another person, so why do you believe something different from me? They have to understand it in themselves, mm -hmm. right? So my, my argument is to expect people to have more empathy and tolerance and understanding of, of people that have a completely different um guidebook to reality who think that, that the world is completely different from what they believe you have to start from the place of understanding your own beliefs um, and then you can take that skill and start to listen to other people so i think we it's not you know this conversation around tolerance and empathy and all the work that's going on to understand racial discrimination i i, I i think that is all hugely important but i think you're asking a lot of people to understand difference until you understand your own motivations and what wires yourself. Mm -hmm. We have a question from the audience that ties into this whole idea of um, uh, that we're currently seeing a new age of, of in history of uh, being overwhelmed with information, etc. Um, so do you see any historic parallels to these trust issues um, that we are currently experiencing with regards to um, facts? Can I believe them or not? Um, so I, th I think the era, we in, the era we're in is unprecedented, but the similarity, which I think is quite interesting. So what I wrote about in, in my book was um, that trust has basically been in three chapters. So you've had this local um, chapter of trust when people lived in tribes and small communities then trust became institutionalized and now it's becoming more and more distributed um, i think what is really interesting is this sort of full cycle of local trust um, and tribalism but reinvented again on a scale that we haven't seen before mm -hmm. so um, i don't think this is a new problem again i think this is how the dynamics of trust um, have worked and then evolved, and then we've kind of gone back um, to how trust used to function in the early stages of society. It's the scale of this thing that is completely different, um, the scale of the tribalism that is completely different. Mm -hmm. What I, as a journalist, find intriguing is um, that people seem to be willing to trust a... Um, completely new website or even just some random uh, link that they that is shared through um, social media channels as much as they trust established um, sources of news that have proven for decades um, that they deserve our trust. Do you have any explanation for that? Well, I'm just interested why that surprises you. Like why... why well, maybe I'm I'm too much of an insider, but I would I would think so. Actually, if we if we do want to have a historic parallel, um, I believe it was some 120 years ago or so that um, you had lots and lots of misinformation in in regular reg, regular newspapers, and there were many many, especially in cities like New York, Berlin, uh, London, and then something like the New York Times was nothing at the time, but but it became this trusted uh, source of information over, as I said, 100 years, essentially. Um, but then there suddenly comes a, a moon-blooming Herald, and just because it has the name Herald uh, in the website's name, people seem to be willing to, to believe whatever they read there. And um, how can I not be surprised about that? 
Well, I think it's a, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying I don't trust information more that comes from a credible source of information than one I receive randomly, but I find it actually quite easy to understand why it's so. Mm -hmm. Because, um, first of all, you know, I think sometimes um, institutions, particularly media institutions, uh, they over rely on sort of the signal of the brand, right? So that we've been around for a hundred years, why wouldn't people trust that source of information? And that's not the way things work anymore. And you see this across, you know, you see this across professional services and mm -hmm. financial institutions. So the signals that people use to decide whether something is trustworthy has completely shifted. But the second thing I think is interesting is you think, um, you know, most of our, uh, what we believe to be true or false comes from indirect knowledge. And I could argue like the trust that I need um, in a newspaper, um, that I have to trust the motives and the interests of that newspaper, I have to trust the journalist, I have to trust that piece of writing. Whereas when I get something that is directly sent to me um, from someone say I know who I think I know, um, I think there's only one layer of trust there. So it feels like a more direct source of information. Um, and that I think is is one of the challenge of uh, challenges of traditional media is is that traditional media, um, which actually ironically makes it often more credible in terms of the information, relies on layers and layers of trust, whereas this information that is directly sent to, sent to us feels like this very direct source of trust, and that's why I think we often have a response to it that is very different from information from a news article. Mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of um, sort of trustworthiness uh, or trust comes, of course, from seeing images, um, hearing something that that is authentic, and suddenly now we're getting into an age of where artificial intelligence can produce, literally mass produce um, texts. Uh, this, there's a new system out there called GPT-3 that can do this. Then we have the, the so-called deep fakes of images and videos even. How, if, if we're already seeing this crisis of trust, how are we supposed to deal with that next level from your perspective? So you mean, so things like deep fakes and mm -hmm. when even having a shared sense of what is reality, not just what is true or not, what is real. Um, Again, I don't think the solutions lie in the technology. I think if we wait for um, design solutions around being able to flag content that has come from an unreliable source or that that person is not real, um, it will be game over. It will be too late. Um, so you know, again, I think, I, I know I keep defaulting to this, but I've, I've thought about it a lot that I don't think the answers lie in external tools. Mm -hmm. I think the answers lie in us all having a much um, clearer understanding of the relationship between trust and knowledge and facts and truth and all these things that shape how we see the world. Um, and the fact that we're not educating children around this in primary school, I find astonishing. You know, if there was something, you know, I think of all the work they do now, um, all the subjects they do that address some kind of external personal harm or self-development, like why is this not something we're teaching from the, mo the moment a child goes into school? Mm -hmm. should, should digital literacy, literacy be, be a part of this as well? I think it, but I, I'm not even sure we have the right word for it. I don't even know if it is, it's more than dig, digital literacy, right? Like it's, um, I, I don't have the word to describe um, the self-awareness to understand the information and people that have an influence on us. You know, I have um, a nine-year-old um, and when he comes home and he tells me um, that he thinks I mean, he, he's, he thinks COVID is a hoax because someone at school told him no one's really died. And he starts, well, he's nine years old. And, and he how, starts, what do you answer? What, what do you tell him? I mean, he, will, he will talk, he has pieces that people have told him, right? So he'll start talking about China. He'll start talking about animals. 
uh, he'll start talking about Trump. Um, he'll start talking about Boris Johnson and lies. He'll start talking about Cummings. So it's unbelievable the fragments mm -hmm. that he has picked up. And then he's mushed them together, right, in an explanation that a nine-year-old can understand that this is so complicated that it can't be real because it makes no sense to him. And so I break it down. We break it apart. So I don't sit there and go, Jack, um, you should never say that, right? You should never say that COVID's a hoax because people are dying out there and give him the um, facts and figures around death rates and infections. Um, I, I try to go through and to help him understand and be honest about, okay, where did you pick up that piece of information? Oh, well, so-and-so said that. Where did they pick up that piece of information? And to make him aware how he stitched together a picture that he can understand. So I think what sometimes we do, not just as parents, um, but I do this with friends sometimes, I do it with my students, is there is a tendency to mistake ignorance for conformity. That we just say that person's stupid or you're gullible, or, you're ignorant. And without even saying those words, you're dismissing what could be a very important and valuable conversation to understand why he's picked up that information and why he's telling himself that story. And I think if we could amplify that interaction over and over and over again in a children's life, we, we, mm -hmm. we'd start, we'd have a chance of helping them think about the information that they absorb and who they trust. So your son obviously is very lucky because he, he has <laughs> he, uh, he has you and and uh, I assume uh, other family members who who help him in this respect. But what you just said, this this piecemeal of information and and everything sort of coming together um, in our heads, and then we come to certain beliefs that more and more often seem to outweigh uh, what scientists say, for example or, um, you know, what are generally considered to be facts. Um, uh, how, how, do we, how do we get sort of mentors, if you will, of, this, of the sort that you described uh, yourself being, how do we get that for, for all of us, in effect? Because all of us need that self-reflection um, and this questioning of, of our beliefs. Yeah, and, in, and I know it sounds, what I'm suggesting sounds like, quite a privileged, educated suggestion, right? So I, I'm fully aware of that. And, and one of the things I actually believe is that we need a curriculum around this stuff. And it's not digital literacy. I think digital literacy is, is important, but it's somewhat um, not of an elephant in the room, but there's something deeper that we need to introduce into our curriculum. I mean, I think it starts, I mean, I, I'd ask the audience, like how much reading and awareness do you have around how beliefs work, how you decide whether information is true or not. Like how much investment have you made into that part of your life? Um, and I'm the first one to say, you know, I've been studying trust and it's really only in the last three years that I've made this investment in myself um, because I realized it was probably one of the most important life skills that we could have right now to realize when we are vulnerable to being manipulated um, and to being conned. So um, th this is a very interesting question. When, when you talk about manipulation, there's a new um, documentary out on Netflix, The Social Dilemma, which describes through uh, voices of, of basically witnesses are, are many uh, former um, uh, high-ranking managers and developers for um, Facebook, Google, Pinterest, yeah. um, Roger McNamee, who spoke at DLD20, Tristan Harris, uh, also spoke at DLD20. They, they all describe how we're essentially being manipulated into um, spending more time with these services. Uh, you also spoke, of course, in your talk a year earlier um, about leaps of trust and how we need to invest this kind of trust in something new. Um, do, do you feel betrayed in a sense? Did, they, uh, did these platforms um, uh, betray our trust by manipulating us? 
I think they crossed the line. So I think to mm, sort of pre last election, so let's say 2007, 2008, Sorry, um, to that. I'm, I've, yeah. <laughs> I've clearly lost track of time. Right? Yeah, that was, mm. um, and I've lost a decade. Um, they crossed a marker, right? So one of the things that struck me from watching The Social Dilemma, and I've often thought about this um, as an early sort of ambassador of the sharing economy, um, it's very, very hard to understand the unintended consequences of things at scale. Mm. It, it's a very hard thing to do. Um, and you know from spending a lot of time with the entrepreneurs in the space of the sharing economy you know some of those unintended consequences i know they were not thinking about them in 2000 and 2009 2008 2009 and that doesn't make them bad people but i think the reason why i think the last election and, and slightly before was a marker is we started to become aware of the consequences of these technologies and the one thing i was left wondering uh, when I finished watching The Social Dilemma is I thought about other things in our lives that can cause addiction, can cause suicide, can cause a war, can break down democracy. They wouldn't be allowed to exist. We turn them off. And so that's the part that I now cannot forgive them for is that the consequences of these platforms and the knowledge they now have around these consequences that are life-threatening how they cannot take more responsibility around that that that's the part i have a really hard time when I watched that documentary. Like I'm very aware of the problems and I had a degree of empathy to the point where they didn't realize the unintended consequences of the things that they were creating. You know, I remember the scene where the guy was talking about the like button and his intention for creating the like button was that he wanted people to make people feel good. You know, never did he think there would be an impact on, you know, the graph I think they showed after that was um, suicide in young girls or mental depression between the ages mm -hmm. of seven and 12. He never thought it would have that kind of impact. But once we become aware of that impact, we have a different responsibility. And so that's the part I'm struggling with in this debate is we know the harm that these platforms can cause. And yet we're still having the same conversation that we've been having for five years now. And do you have any recommendation? What uh, is it? Is it is the answer more governance, or is it us becoming, as you suggest, more aware of our own behavior and and simply abstaining? Well, you know, you think. I mean, not to put this down to a basic list, right? But we've really got a few choices here. Um, the one is the first thing is that we rely on ourselves, and I think these things are too sophisticated to rely on ourselves. You know, the other line that really stuck in my, my head is that there's only two industries that describe themselves as users, which is drugs and technology, right? So mm -hmm. I don't think we can trust ourselves. So no, I don't think we can rely on ourselves. Um, the second is we just turn them off, right? Like we just we just say, right, this is illegal. We, that's not going to happen. Uh, the third is that uh, a combination of responsibility of the platform and external regulation that enforces that responsibility. And to be honest, I see no other choice. I see no other choice right now than, and this is an important distinction, that platforms take responsibility for the content, not necessarily the consequences of the content. They're two different things, right? So there is there is a responsibility for the content that is posted, but you cannot be held responsible for the consequences of that content. Mm -hmm. So you mean if somebody uh, reads something on a platform like this, then acts upon that information, that should be outside of the responsibility of the... The, the platform is responsible for the information the person read, mm -hmm. but they can't be responsible for the action that that person took. Um, and that's where I think the debate has got really fuzzy and that we've conflated those two things. There's a difference between content 
and consequence and that if we focus on response and i know those two two things are, are hard to delineate but it, it's almost impossible to be able to predetermine the consequence of a piece of content um, mm -hmm. but being responsible for the information that is posted based on what that information is that's a very different conversation we also have a question here whether whether maybe um trust is related to design choices and and interface you sort of hinted at that with the like button just now i'm wondering if maybe we can also um help regain trust in each other through these mechanisms maybe there is a you know there's this buzzword of gamification but maybe there's really a way of having an interactive exchange of ideas um, in a playful way in an educational way um, that comes down to uh, uh, design choices and and um, uh, yeah sorry no I think it's, <laughs> it's a really interesting question I mean I think one of and you may have seen this but I haven't seen this and I find this really interesting um, and I, I don't know how you do this but um, a curatorial service that designs a trusted, um, verified uh, circle of information, not with complete views that agree with one another, actually like a diverse range of sources and, and um, facts, um, that they would curate that circle for you. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, if I just if I want uh, really reliable information about government policies around COVID, um, what are the five sources of information that I should be reading on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. If I want five sources of information that truly help me understand where undecided voters, um, the influence of the Supreme Court de decision, what that may have on their vote, like that we can actually go in and put issues that we deeply care about and that it would curate. But then you'd have to have trust in the algorithm. I realize that, but do you know what I mean? I, I think that's what's missing is that you, act, you personally now have to put in a lot of work mm -hmm. to curate that network. And that takes time and investment and energy and resources many of us don't have. So that I think is is also there's a design solution there. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, well, I, I agree, but it takes us back to this question of who who do you trust in the first place? Do you rate uh, somebody like Breitbart, a right wing website in the U.S.? Do you trust them? Uh, do you rate them as trustworthy or not? Um, there are websites like um, uh, to, to fact check, and some people um, actively use them. But if you don't use them. Obviously, a lot of that, um, you know, is just goes past you. Um, uh, so we we have a number of questions actually that that are quite uh, pragmatic. In we've we've sort of discussed the lofty heights here a little bit. Yeah. Um, so let me let me ask you, and I'm, I, I find it fantastic that we have uh, somebody in Finland tuning in. Hello there. Um, who asked, uh, who saw you apparently a few years ago in Finland and is now asking how people can uh, trust more in experimentation, use this context of COVID uh, as an opportunity for trial, uh, for trial and, and error um, in, in various business contexts? Um, do you, do I'm not sure I understand the question. So that, could you ask the so question again? It's, it's, well, it's, is uh, the way I understand it, um, is this crisis essentially creating a situation where um, we can trust more in, in unproven uh, things because it kind of requires trial and error. And I apologize if I misinterpret that, but, but that's uh, uh, the way I read it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Um... <sighs> I don't know if trust is the way I'd explain that. I think we have no choice but to place, take higher leaps. No, we seem um, to have a bit of a bad. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Oh, maybe it's my connection or Rachel is frozen. Am I frozen? So Carson, just should I keep talking? Okay, I'll keep talking. Someone said you're good, Rachel. So 
Um, I think at the heart of this question, if I understand it correctly, is, is tied to this idea that I call trust leaps. So trust leaps are when we take a risk to do something new or to do something differently from the way that we've done it before. And you think about it, we've been taking trust leaps since the beginning of time. This is how we move forward. This is how innovation um, and society progresses. Now, to the person who asked the question, what this time requires is, is higher and faster trust leaps than we have ever taken. And we're seeing this, right? So the move to virtual working is an enormous trust leap. Uh, the move to telehealth, the move to home testing, all these things that we're seeing in advanced care, advanced in healthcare. So yes, what we need is to take these trust leaps um, into the unknown more than ever before, because that is the place of discovery, right? Now, the hard thing is, that is very easy to say, but if you're in a business, um, any kind of business, even if you're not in a business that has been hit incredibly hard by COVID-19, what uncertainty does is that for most people, it pushes them back to the known and the familiar. They go back to the stability, they go back to the certainty, they go back to the control. So helping people innovate, helping them to have the courage to even enter that space of thinking right now is the time to create these trust leaps. Now is the time to actually take these risks to change people's behaviors mm -hmm. is incredibly difficult. And I think this is something that I, I'm not seeing a lot of conversation around. I'm seeing a lot of conversation around how do you create trust in virtual teams? And it's very much about communication, but a mindset thing of how do you encourage people when they're often at home and they're isolated to take these risks and to have the courage to go into the unknown with whatever industry they're in is a huge challenge right now. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you so much for that insight. Um, we have another question business related. Uh, what is your advice to senior decision makers um, to create a more, let's say, forgiving atmosphere, um, You know, let go of past disagreements, concentrate on developing trust and collaboration? Um, I feel somewhat reminded of an episode of your of your podcast last year where you spoke to David Coulthard, the Formula One player who spoke of taking responsibility versus versus blame. But you can for sure better explain that. Yeah, no. So um, I was it's funny you raise that conversation because, you know, sometimes you speak to people and, and you can't shake what they said. So. Um, I was asking T David Coulthard, who, of course, was a famous British Form Formula One driver. Um, like, I wanted to, I wanted to know, like, when a mistake is made um, on the racetrack. So, say, like, the left engineer doesn't turn the wheel, put the wheel on properly, and the wheel falls off. What happens in that debrief room? Like, mm -hmm. how do they learn to trust that uh, engineer and mechanic ever again? And it was so interesting what he said, because he said the thing he misses the most about Formula One is it is a completely a no blame culture. Mm -hmm. So it's a culture, what he described, a full responsibility that that was not, no one would even look at the left mechanic in the debrief. It would be a culture of that whole team was responsible for that mistake. And I, you know, he said he's worked in many different environments and he's never experienced that full responsibility, no blame culture. Now, I think for many organizations that would be extremely difficult to make that kind of shift. But somehow this idea that the blame isn't on the individual, um, that there was something in the system, the environment, in the culture, even in the incentives and re rewards that made that person make that mistake, I think can make a huge shift. Mm -hmm. The other advice, um, and I see this a lot where trust is broken down in teams, um, is that it becomes blanket. And what I mean by blanket is people start saying, well, I don't trust this person or I don't trust this boss. Um, and what they lose sight of is the incident or the particular behavior that is driving that distrust. So in these situations where you have a team that is in a very low state of distrust, it's actually bring it back to a context or a situation where you can actually pinpoint where those trust issues are coming from. 
um, unless you know the source and the cause, it's very hard to ever move on from that toxic feeling of distrust. And okay, so is there a recovery from the situation that you just uh, explained? What what is what is a hands-on advice for for business managers then? Well, the first thing is have the conversation, right? So um, I know this sounds obvious, but it's a bit like couples that are suffering from trust issues. You're like, have you even spoken about it? So, um, you know, I do a lot of work with senior leaders and they're off, one will tell me one thing and the other one will tell me the other thing. And I'm like, well, have you said this to each other? So, it's, you know, people will avoid conversations about distrust like the play because uh, they're worried about how it will make the other person feel. I mean, it's not a very nice thing to say that you don't trust someone. So the first thing is actually to have the conversation. And the second thing is to make the conversation very precise. So don't talk about trust in these vague terms. Actually say, there is this thing that you do and it makes me feel this way. And if we could fix it, I think we could shift this relationship. Um, I know you've got Esther Perel coming on in December, but it's something that we've spoken about that um, if you can actually come back from uh, relationships that have broken down from a place of distrust, those relationships can be stronger than they were before. So distrust isn't always a bad thing. It's, it's actually having the conversation and how you use it to move forwards mm -hmm. versus being stuck in that downward spiral. But it probably feels more natural to have these, this, these kinds of conversations if couples, for example, manage to have them, it feels more natural to have them in a private setting, not so much in a in a business setting. So the for the for the boss to to bring up something like this um, or among colleagues, um, is there still a kind of stigma, do you think, attached to to um, discussions like this that are a little bit feel a little bit emotional, maybe to many? Well, I don't think either side likes the emotion or the feeling around this, mm. but I think it's actually um, asking yourself the consequences of letting these trust issues fester, both in terms of your own psyche and well-being, but also the team and the entire culture of the organization. So. We've all been there, right? Like when you've been in a team and someone starts talking badly and, and you know, the thing starts and then it amplifies and then it takes over very quickly. So I think as a leader, you, you have a choice, right? You either are going to let this thing fester or you're going to address it head on. And it is going to be emotional and it is going to require feeling and it is going to be difficult because it's complex in its very nature. And ultimately, as you said, it's it's you can only win by addressing it. Um, uh, because if you don't, then the, con the consequences may be dire. What I wouldn't even think about it is winning. So one of the things that has helped me um, with these conversations is to actually go in um, and throw away defensiveness and throw away this idea that someone is right and someone is wrong and to go in with intense curiosity. Um, I, I think this is, this is a leadership skill, uh, again, that we're not really taught how to be intensely curious. So if you're a leader, and particularly if someone's saying, I don't trust you, right? If you go in defensive and, and sort of, it's not me, it's you, blah, blah, blah. Like that conversation is not going to go anywhere. If you go in and someone's going to be right and someone's going to be wrong, it's not going to go anywhere. If mm -hmm. either side or both sides go in intensely curious to find out what it is that I'm doing that has this impact on you, you will have a very different conversation. Well, I feel that takes us back actually to the whole polarization debate. Um, you know, of of at least in terms of politics and and um, things like like vaccination and COVID nineteen that we talked about. Um, I'm not so sure I could have that kind of debate with somebody who believes the Earth is flat. Um, so uh, at some point, um, I guess I don't know. What would you say if somebody can you can you really have an open discussion with somebody who who believes that the Earth is flat against all all facts and and scientific um, even you just fly and you look out of the 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 window of the plane and you see the curvature of the earth so uh, how do you address something like that so I, so i'm interested not so i will answer the question but why do you think you couldn't have what is it about the flat earth conversation or the flat earth belief that would make that conversation particularly difficult for you 
Well, because you, and maybe you can see I'm, I'm a little bit biased here, maybe too many hours on the plane. Um, but if, if all the evidence, um, again, from science and my own evidence, um, basically invalidates from the get-go what the other person may have to say, then how, what, where's the common ground? Well, you don't have to find common ground. This is what I think is interesting. So I think most people would go into that conversation trying to prove the other person wrong, mm -hmm. um, trying to come out and validate their own opinion or how smart they were. And I think very few people would go into that conversation, again, truly curious about when did that belief form? Mm -hmm. what, where were you in your life? What was going on in your life? Did something happen to you at that moment in time? Was there a particular trigger? Was there a piece of information? Was there a person? I would find that all completely fascinating. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I may not, I, I wouldn't come out agreeing that the earth is flat, but I would come out understanding why that person believed that. And I may learn something about myself that I'd never considered. So I think that's the difference is that we shouldn't go into these conversations, these very difficult conversations, whether they be about science or about race or about sexuality, trying to win or even to try and validate our own opinion. We should go in just trying to be intensely curious, understanding whether, whether and respectful of where the other person's beliefs have come from. And I think this is a major problem in that we are so quick to point to someone being ignorant and gullible and crazy and stupid. And to go back to your point, like that's where the divisiveness comes from. It's the label that we place on the other side and the other group without saying you can respectfully believe something that is very different from my own. And maybe I can learn something from you, even if what we believe is completely different. Well, there was a wonderful, um, uh, call to to all of us to be more open and I will certainly heed that um, as a journalist of course I'm always curious but I have to admit that there's a certain uh, challenge for me in you know with 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 particular uh, topics there and how far I could go um, but I think on that point it's worth asking yourself what is it about that topic that sets me off and I think it's something to do with your identity that you do value science and you do value evidence, you do value facts, right? That is who you are, right? So for me, the one that is really hard is anti-vaxxers. And that's because so much of my identity is about being a parent. And as soon as I say, okay, well, the anti-vaxxers motivation is also to do the right thing for their kids. I can still go into that conversation as hard as it is because it's my emotional trigger. So this, I think even like thinking about the why is this conversation one of the hardest ones that I could have, you mm -hmm. can understand something about yourself. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel. We are, we are at the end of uh, the, the hour that we had set aside for this. I certainly hope we can continue this um, a little more. Uh, I believe there's another book in the works. Once you're ready to talk about that, um, then... Uh, uh, Hopefully we, we can we can continue this. See you back here um, for uh, our audience. The, the quick um, note that our next DLD Sync will be with Sir Ronald Cohen about impact investing on October the fifth. Thank you very much for for your interest in our talk here, and you can always revisit this on DLD News. Um, and again, Rachel, thank you very much. Have a nice evening, and hope to see you soon. All the best. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.